Thank you. We're really excited to be here today. Uh, again, my name is Krista Hazenkope. I'm an atmospheric scientist. And this is Joe Flasher, who is a developer at Development Seed. And together, we're co-founders of OpenAQ. Uh, our mission is to open up the world's air quality data. So we'll talk about the why, the how, um, in a moment. Uh, but first, we're going to go to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, where the seed of this idea first began a couple years ago. So about three or four years ago, Joe and I spent a couple years living in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, we, we were doing research and, and doing other work in the tech community. But um, we saw that the air looked like this. And so and there's very little access to air quality data uh, for the public, even though it is one of the most polluted places in the world. Uh, and so with colleagues at the National University of Mongolia, we built the country's first uh, automatically social media posting air quality instrument that shared data with the public. Um, and even though it was a side project, it wasn't something um, that was our main work there, it actually had the most impact. We, it was uh, something that um, eventually garnered national level attention around air pollution mitigation issues. It elevated the role of science and, and data in making uh, uh, policy decisions. And so for us, it was a turning point in realizing the power of environmental open data uh, that it can have on a community. And I did want to point out, in some places in Ulaanbaatar, actually, to, to give a sense of just how polluted it is, uh, you experience the, kind of, the same kind of air one would experience uh, uh, fighting a wildfire. So it's extremely polluted. But the thing is, is pollution is not an issue for one city or one country. Uh, it's, it's a global killer. It's responsible for one out of every eight deaths in the world. And to give you a sense of scale, that's more than the number of deaths in a given year for HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. And it predominantly impacts developing countries. It's also not an issue that's going to be going away anytime soon, as far as we can tell. Uh, a recent study projects that while the world's population will grow by about a third by 2050, uh, the number of deaths due to air pollution are expected to double. And often it's the case that in the most polluted places, uh, there's also the least data or the least studies that have been able to be done. Um, so, and this graph shows that. So if we look at the, the x-axis on the bottom, this shows the number of air pollution papers published in the scientific literature for a variety of different cities. And then on the y-axis, you see smoke and dust levels for over the course of a year, or PM10 values uh, for those same cities. And the, the cities in red are actually the top 10 most polluted places in the world. You'll see Ulaanbaatar up there, actually. Uh, and the, you'll also see that there's very few papers that have been published, uh, studies that have been done uh, for them. And if, if you sum up all of these papers, you get this dashed red line. And uh, that dashed red line is 20 times less than what you find for London. And London has an order of magnitude clearer air. So I think this graphic uh, is great for depicting uh, the serious divide between the air quality have, haves and have-nots. And, and that's a very uh, serious issue. Um, and brings up a lot of uh, key public health questions, such as the one we'll show here. So in the EU and the US, we have a pretty clear understanding of the relationship between air pollution levels and uh, risk of death. Um, that comes from lots of studies, lar large cohort studies, epidemiological studies, um, and, and lots of air quality data. But that's not the case uh, in much more polluted places, where billions of people live. That understanding is, is not nearly as robust, uh, and big questions remain. A big factor in this question mark is not having air access to air quality data. And so this is one example, uh, the public health sector, uh, that could benefit from access, improved access to air quality data, uh, let alone real-time air quality data. Another one is in the media. Uh, for example, we've seen all over China when air quality data, real-time air quality data access was uh, available or really uh, scraped from government websites, third-party apps developed all over the place, sharing local uh, air quality information in the way that made the most sense for those communities. Another example is in uh, India, uh, when last, a couple years ago, at this point, uh, a comparison was made between Beijing air quality and New Delhi air quality, and a graphic uh, is shown here 
this, this one graphic really galvanized an entire nation and galvanized India around air quality issues. It really elevated uh, the conversation around mitigation policies there. Uh, another sector that has not yet uh, really been able to tap into real-time air quality data but would be tremendously benefited is uh, it was satellite retrievals to do air quality measurements. Uh, same goes for on a different scale with low-cost sensors uh, that, for, that citizen scientists might use. Both would benefit from being able to ground truth and, and calibrate their instruments uh, with, with real-time access to air quality data. We also see that environmental activism uh, groups would be very interested in this data. There's a group in Houston right now who's just waiting to have access to their uh, air quality data. They have a ton, but they don't have a way to get to that data. Uh, they want to tweet out uh, ozone violations in their region. And of course, in terms of air pollution policies, the public uh, can judge whether those policies are actually working or not if they have access to, to air quality data. And so we've shown this picture with these gears interlocking, but this isn't actually how the picture looks. Uh, and we'll talk about why. So what is the state of uh, real-time air quality data across the world? Uh, it kind of looks like this. So there's over 16,000 publicly sharing, government-sponsored, typically, uh, air quality monitors around the world that share their data online. Uh, they're all in disparate forms, uh, sharing more or less the same pollutants, but some variety. Uh, and uh, there's a key thing that a lot of this data appears for maybe 15 minutes or an hour, and then it disappears, and it's gone from the record. And so there's a few efforts out there that are aggregating this information and putting it on maps or making it regionally uh, available through a uh, API for a cost, or they're putting out air quality index values, which uh, are often good for public messaging, but not good for many of those sectors. They rely on actual air quality measurements. Uh, so we think these are efforts are awesome, but they're not sufficient. So we can see that there's all this real-time air quality data out there. And Krista showed the need for all this data. But you can see that there's obviously a gap. And so that's a problem. And so we think that we know how to fix that. And that's with open, programmatic, and historical access to air quality data. And so our three guiding principles are open historical data access and programmatic access. So this means open. It's freely available for everyone. Uh, there's historical. So you can go back in history and get data. So you're not losing access to the data. And also, it's programmatic access. So this means that people can build tools on top of it. We also believe in open source. And so we want it to be open for everyone to see. So transparency in knowing where the data comes from and how the data is being presented. But it's also open source so that we hopefully get contributions from others. right? And finally, it's community driven. So this means we're reaching out to a lot of partners uh, and asking them what they need in the data, how they would like to use the data. So we've had a lot of conversations uh, along those lines. But also, we're looking for partners in building up the platform. Uh, we are not looking for this to be controlled by a small group of people, but rather to have it uh, controlled by a global community. So a couple of highlights. Uh, this would have been much more impressive. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you didn't see the Thomson Reuter numbers. So uh, this would be much more impressive for you. Um, but we've only been up for about two months. Uh, we've got over 400 sites. Krista mentioned 16,000, so we have a lot to go. Uh, but we've got almost a million measurements, which is really big, right? Because keep in mind, uh, other than the most recent measurements for all these places, uh, some close to a million of those data points wouldn't be available anymore. They would just be gone from the record. Uh, so we capture seven different pollutants. We think these are the key pollutants to look out for. And on the map here, you can see the areas in dark blue are areas where we think we've gotten most of the data within the country. And light blue is where we just have some data in the country. So um, the system currently is pretty simple. We have a mechanism that runs every 10 minutes to go out and fetch data. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, it saves the data to a database, and we've built a RESTful API on top of that, so you can query and filter the results that you're getting. Uh, and then we have built uh, a website on top of that. Um, so there's no tricks with our website. Um, we just use the same API that's available to everyone else. Uh, so what we build and what we build out will just be one example of what you can do with the data available. So let's look a little bit more at the data ingest piece. Uh, so like I said, this is uh, something that runs every 10 minutes. 
We're currently pulling in data from both websites, and so this is via scraping, and uh, from APIs, right? So some places have APIs, which is awesome. A lot of places don't, and so we're actually going through and doing the painful process of scraping the data from the sites. So we have the concept of sources. So sources is an API URL, or it's a website URL. And then the source has an adapter associated with it. And this is where the magic happens. This is where you actually go through the process of converting the source data into our data format. Uh, and then before it gets saved to the database, it goes through a bit of validation. And this is really technical validation. So this is making sure that uh, the, number, the value field is a number and it's not a string, right? Or that if it has geographic coordinates, it's stored in latitude and longitude. And those are numbers and not strings. So, the, the important thing here is we're not making value assumptions on the data that we're getting. We are simply getting the data and then saving it to the database. So for example, there are very large negative numbers in the database, right? Like there's like nine, minus 900. Um, and that probably points to a problem with the instrument, but we're not making those value assumptions. We're merely saving the data that's being presented. So let's take a look at what the data looks like. Um, we store of what we think are the, the most important things. So date, we're storing both UTC and local. UTC is great for programming, um, but one of the big powers of the system is going to be allow you to do uh, morning to morning comparisons globally, right? So you could have one map where you're showing the pollution from morning to morning everywhere, and you can't get that with UTC. Um, we, of course, store location, city, country information, we have coordinates, geographic coordinates. Not all of our measurements have coordinates, but about 80% of them do, and it's easy to add them after we get them. Um, and then we also store an attribution field. So this is a way that we can be very transparent about where the data is coming from. So just a few example requests. Um, if you're looking for a weekend in Beijing, currently we only have one Beijing uh, instrument. This is sitting at the embassy. Um, uh, just for a weekend, and you can just get a time boxed uh, study region. So this will get you all the measurements for PM 2.5 for that. Uh, in Houston, where we have, I think, something like 60 sources coming in, um, this would get you, it's a threshold study, so you would get all the PM 2.5 values, values that were above a certain level, so in this case, 100. And this one's interesting, there's a quiz right at the end of this one, so I hope some, some of you are local. Uh, this one's for Great Britain, currently that's just London, so we have about 16 different instruments. Uh, and here we're saying, give me the top 20 PM10 measurements, and so I did this right before I came here. Uh, there is one location that uh, I think had half of the top 20. Uh, I don't know, this is probably like the worst quiz ever. Does anyone want to take a guess? Uh, okay, good. Probably it's better you don't guess. Uh, but it was Ealinghorn Lane. I don't actually know where that is, so I'm not making any judgments here. <laughs> Uh, so on the horizon, um, what are we looking to do for the platform? Obviously, there's a lot more sources to pull in, right? So uh, this is sort of the unfun task of going out and getting these sources and making these adapters to put their data into our system. We also can provide a lot more functionality uh, via the API. So things like aggregating and averaging. So with one API call, you can say, I don't just want the measurements. I want you to give me a daily average or a monthly average or a yearly average. I want you to tell me certain numbers associated with this. And so we can do a lot more of that for you, and so it's easier for you to handle the data. We also want to build up a lot more maps, visualizations, and stories around the data. And finally, as we get more data and as we get more demand, we will also need to build up more infrastructure. And so as Joe emphasized, uh, a key part of our work is really the community that we're building uh, for this platform to, to use, help build, uh, and build off of it. And so we're conducting, uh, one way that we're reaching out to our communities is we're conducting workshops uh, to engage with the local science, uh, journalism, and tech communities. Our first one will be in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, since that's where this story, story first began. Uh, in just a couple weeks, in fact, and we'll also be at a couple other conferences uh, in the U.S. in a uh, couple months. Um, but uh, we firmly believe in the mission of opening up the world's air quality data, uh, and if you two are passionate about enabling truly previously impossible science, uh, influencing policy, and empowering the public around open environmental data, we invite you to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.